appropriate to have it during Christmas because Christmas is uh, Jesus' birthday. That's what we celebrate on Christmas morning. It's, a, it's one big birthday party in that sense. And, and uh, so, you know, I, do, I wanted to, to focus this morning on a, a very famous true passage on, a passage on uh, Jesus' birth from Luke chapter 2. It was actually referred to in the call to worship this morning. And I don't have time to go through everything about the Christmas story. But I want to just focus on this nice passage. Uh, and underneath two basic headings, I don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, good news, great joy. That's the title of today's message. Good news, great joy. Just before our passage in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, is the actual story of the birth of Christ. It talks about how he was born in, in a manger in Bethlehem. And then, for some reason, the Bible puts this story in about the angels and shepherds. And it says in verses 8 to, tw- to, uh, to 14, There were shepherds living, living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Any good news always is accompanied, or usually is accompanied, with fanfare and celebration. Special news conferences, premiere showings, opening nights, newspaper announcements of baby births and weddings, or appointments of new board members, special invitations, gala events. So what happened on the first Christmas, on the birth of Jesus Christ? Miracles, miraculous announcement. First, well, there was the glory of the Lord shining around them. Verse 9, I don't know exactly what it was, but I picture a beam of light, like in the theater, you know, a spotlight, boom, on the shepherds. Picture that. And then an angel of the Lord appears to them. An angel, the, Bible, uh, the word for angel means messenger. We don't know exactly what angels look like. Sometimes they look like men. Sometimes they had wings. Uh, they, they, they probably didn't have harps in their hands, okay, so don't think that. And, and, and definitely they were not you know, naked little babies, like in Valentine's Day, okay? <laughs> okay, that, that was not the angel. How we know the angel, exact, the angel messenger didn't look like that was because the Bible says the, 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 the shepherds were terrified, okay? So a little baby, you're not gonna, you know, you, they probably try to tickle the baby. Right? <laughs> they wouldn't, but these are, they were scared. They were scared, terrified, right? They were awestruck. Imagine if something like that happens, all of a sudden something float, a man with wings maybe floats down in front of you. And then suddenly, a great company, later, verse 13, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God. Now, this heaven, heavenly host, host means army, not choir, okay? So, unfortunately, I hate to break your, your mythology, but it wasn't a choir of angels there. It was an army of angels. Okay? Picture, you know, I, I, yesterday I saw the, uh, the Hobbit, okay? Very interesting, it's a big stretch. And don't worry, I'm not going to break it. I'm going to ruin it for you. But <laughs> that's what they all say. Reverend Ted always ruins the movies. But there's a lot of armies. It's called the five armies, right? One of them is the elven army, the elves. I, I picture that, that kind of shiny beings, thousands of them in the heavens. That's the heavenly host. Okay, so we're not talking choir, choir members with these choir robes on, okay? So picture, so no bathrobes, nothing like that, okay? Picture wearing armor, swords, hel- helmets. That's the, 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 the preamble. So, what, so what's this good news they present? It's a good news of salvation. Verse 10, I bring you, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Good news, it, it, it means, that's, that's the word gospel, by the way. You ever heard the term gospel? Gospel is good news. Okay? To the Jews, he would be the redeemer, the rescuer, the, the, uh, you know, the person. They, they were underneath the Roman thumb. They were a captive slave nation the whole nation of the Israelites, and to the Jews, they're looking for a savior. They're looking for the the lifeguard, the policeman, the EMT, the SWAT team to come in and rescue them. 
And they probably thought Savior that way, okay? They, they probably thought this army coming in or it's, you know, oh, look at, look at those, those that, are, that are heavenly host. They're gonna, that heavenly host is definitely bigger than the Roman army. They're going to just defeat them, okay? So that's what they're thinking. The Jews are thinking. But we know that wasn't the case. Because even after the baby was born, Jesus, and after 33 years of life and after he died, the Jews were still under the Roman rule. So it wasn't a political savior. What kind of savior is he? Let's look at his characteristics first, and then then we'll look deeper into what what he saves them from. He is, verse 11, the Messiah, the Lord. I spoke about Messiah last week. Messiah means the anointed one. A reference to to the Jews, they knew that this guy called Messiah, anointed one, another word for anointed one is Christ, the Christ, he was, going to, he was going to be the son, of, the son of David, meaning a descendant of King David, and he was going to appear as a king, to, as, as a king over the Israelites. So he was going to be the Messiah king coming, and then he was going to be Lord. Now, Lord in New Testament is used different ways. Some people use it like the term sir or mister. You know, Lord, hey, Lord, Lord, Lord Stanley, uh, thanks for the cup, or whatever, right? Okay, you know, that, that's sort of, sort of the... That's sort of the sir aspect, okay? <laughs> okay? okay? But Lord in this particular context means God. Verse 9, angel of the Lord, Lord God. Verse 9 again, glory of the Lord, not glory of a king, a normal or a, a mister, glory of the, of the God king. Verse 15, which the Lord has told us about, not some person, sir, but the Lord mean God. So in other words, this Messiah, this child born, this Savior, is God himself. And we need to dwell on that a second, because that's an amazing thought. The God of the universe was going to shrink himself down, put himself in a baby. It's more amazing, I think this is the greatest miracle in the Bible. It's more amazing than as if we were to shrink ourselves down to an ant, with, and still retain all our, our abilities as a human. Think of the, the size of God, the ability of God, who God is. Think of His power, His intelligence, His wisdom, His wonderfulness, His awesomeness. Think of all it took to create human, He's just human beings, for example. He creates us, and He allows us to create all these other things. All the things you see around you, the, 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 the building, the technology, Everything, our clothing, our, you know, everything we have, our cars, computers, made by human minds, which was made by the mind created by God. That's God. He doesn't even need to do himself. He just creates things that creates things. God himself. And not only is he that intelligent, but he's able to make things that are, are huge. Think of our, so, so look, go from our bodies to our, our, our city. Think of the size of the GTA, okay? Then think of the size of Ontario, the province. Then think of the size of Canada, then North America, and then the world. The Bible says he just creates it like that. If you, some of you may have done some traveling around the world, and you realize the world is a pretty big place. But according to scientists, there can be 1,300,000 Earths that could fit, 1,300,000 Earths can fit into our sun, which is just a medium-sized sun. So picture our Earth, and then picture 1 million of our Earths, 1,300,000, 1.3. That's just the sun. Okay? It's going to take a while to wrap your mind around that one. Okay? And then they say that our sun is just an average star, which is part of the Milky Way galaxy, which has a hundred billion stars. So I'm not even counting the little planets around them and the space between the stars. 1.3 Earths in our sun, 100 billion, billion suns in our Milky Way galaxy. And then... They say that they've counted the galaxies in a particular region of the sky and they multiply this up to estimate the number of galaxies in the whole universe. And according to the best estimates of astronomers, there are at least 100 billion galaxies 
in the observable universe. <laughs> Make you feel small? <laughs> That's our God. God says He created that, every single one. He knows every name. A hundred billion suns in our galaxy, a hundred billion galaxies. There are so many stars that they estimate there are the same numbers, approximately the same number of stars in the universe as there are grains of sand in every beach on this earth. Can you picture that? Size of God. And then that God comes as a baby. <laughs> That's why I say this is the greatest miracle in the Bible. Can you believe that? It's really hard to comprehend. The God who made all that is coming on Christmas Day. That's why it's good news. Of course it's hard to believe. Who's, you know, even with the angels, how are you going to prove it? Now, the angels come down to shepherds, but shepherds, if they had any idea, they didn't know about the 100 billion times 100 billion, but they had an idea God is big. And then so the angel says, I'm going to prove it to you. This will be the sign, verse 12. You'll find a baby wrath in cloth, cloths lying in a manger. So they hurry off and find Mary and Joseph and a baby lying, wrapping cloths. There may be a few children in those days in Bethlehem that, that were wrapped in cloth. Uh, they were newborns. But there's only one baby who's wrapped in cloth and stuck in an in a animal feeding trough, a manger. Very unusual. <laughs> you don't see that around. You don't see babies stuck on, 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 in, in mangers. We know why it was, because they couldn't find room in the inn. right? But, so this is God, Savior. Okay, so let's go back to the thought. What kind of Savior is He? Why, what takes a big God like that to, to come? He shall save his people, the Bible says. Matthew one twenty one. You are to give him the name Jesus. Jesus means Greek form for, for God saves, Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. That's the kind of Savior. He's not going to save them from the Romans. He's going to save them from their sins. You know, you can tell how big a problem is by how big the solution is demanded and needed for that problem. So therefore, if you need God to solve this problem, that means sin must be a big issue. This is what they call the dark side of Christmas. The dark side of Christmas is this. The reason why Jesus had to come, God himself had to come to, to live a perfect life and die a death for us because sin is such a huge problem. The God of the universe who created everything, all those stars, needs to come. Only he can deal with our sin. That's the dark side of Christmas. It means sin is very serious. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not that bad. I never killed anyone. I'm never. I, I'm a good person. I go to. I give to charity. I go to church. I work hard at school and work. You know, I I change my baby's diapers. I, I I help little old ladies cross the road. Right? No, no. You might be good compared to other people, but are you perfect? Have you never sinned? Romans three twenty three says, "For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God." The Bible says. God is in heaven. Heaven is a perfect place. There's no mistakes, no consistencies. It's perfect. And because of that, only perfect people can go to heaven. And therefore, if you are imperfect, even one little flaw, you can't get in. That means I don't stand a chance in a million getting into heaven. And neither do you by ourselves. None of us bats 1,000. None of us has, is always perfect or right. If there's a giant screen behind us, and behind me, say, see, today this morning they put a giant, they put the screen up, and they had a film of all my sins. It would take hours and hours and hours and a lifetime. And I suspect it'd be the same for you as well. The Bible says only Jesus Christ was perfect. Someone wrote, "If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator." If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent an engineer. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness for our sins, so he sent us a savior. See, the point is not only the, amount, the huge amount of sins that we have in our lives, but the point is that who we've sinned against. If you throw a, 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 a pie in my face, okay, I'll probably just laugh, and depending on the pie, I might eat it, okay? But you throw a pie in the queen's face and you go to jail. It's because of who you've hit. We've sinned against Almighty God, the one who created the universe. That's the bad news of Christmas. But the good news is a Savior has been born to us. Verse, 12, verse 11 again. Born to you. 
He's given us the priceless gift of salvation. That's the good news. He came to live a perfect life and die for our sins as a substitute. And the good news is that, even better, not only that is there a Savior available, but it, the cost of that salvation for us is free. All you have to do is accept it. Recognize that you're a sinner, that you need God, and, and that God's offer of salvation for you is offered freely, and you just need to accept it. Many years ago, there was this, this, this widow living in London, and she had one daughter who was very sick. So the, the disease was complicated by a lack of fresh fruit. And it was wintertime, and there was no money, and, and she had no money, and the, and the widow was going along, you know, along the streets of London. Was, uh, fresh fruit was very expensive. She happened to go by the royal palace, where she sees the greenhouse with some luscious grapes and other fruits. She was longing at the window of that greenhouse, looking at, the, at the, the fresh fruit. A princess comes by. The princess saw the lady looking at the fruit, gets a basket, a huge basket, cuts a lot of fruit off the vines, and gives it to the widow. The widow tried to pay whatever. She was so thankful. She looked into her, her, po- her pocket purse and pulled out a few coins that she had to give to the princess for the fruit. But the princess answered her this way, Madam, these grapes are not for sale. My father is a king. He is much too rich to sell. And besides that, you're much too poor to pay. You can have these grapes for free or not at all. Salvation is free. Anything less or anything otherwise, don't let the other religions tell you you can buy your salvation by good works. Because that just cheapens God and who He is and the, and, the, and, the, and the heinousness of sin and it elevates what you think you can do for your own salvation and your ability to pay for it. It's free. It has to be free. Now, it's not, it wasn't free to buy, but it's free for us. Just like, because free, freedom is never free. Politically, freedom for a country costs the life of soldiers. Spiritually, freedom for us costs the life of Jesus Christ. Max Lucado wrote this on the book Grace. God doesn't overlook your sins lest he endorse them. He didn't punish you lest, you lest he destroy you. Instead, God found a way to punish the sin and preserve the sinner. Jesus took your punishment when he died on the cross and gave you credit for Jesus, and God gave you credit for Jesus' perfection. Christ took our sin and our shame. So now when we give our life to Christ, we can put on a t-shirt that says, I'm forgiven, and God treats me like his son. I am Jesus' brother. God treats me as a son. I don't have to be ashamed. He's not angry with me. That's the good news. That's the good news. Salvation that comes freely. But there's even more good news. Not only is there freedom, but there's also peace. It says here, verse 13 again, Sunny and heavenly host um, comes, uh, comes before the, the shepherds, and verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest. You need glory to God if you want to have the next thing, which is peace on earth for those whom his favor rests. Peace is a word that we use a lot in our culture, but most people don't have the foggiest idea what it is. Some people think peace is drinking until they're so drunk and numb they can no longer feel the pain in their hearts. Others think peace is hopping from one relationship, relationship to the next, to, and then to the next and to the next, that somebody will fill in that void in their life, but nobody ever does. Others think peace is staying busy all the time, so that at night they just don't, they can kind of collapse into their bed and don't have to think, because then if they have to think at nighttime by themselves in the quiet, there's these haunting thoughts, these fears and terrible loneliness that comes caving in, and they don't like that feeling. For others, it's peace is working and working and working, become workaholic, overachieving, so you can get all these attributes of success to prove to the world that you're a somebody. But inside you really feel, no, I don't feel like a somebody. Maybe it's another new age gimmick or something, gazing at crystals or saying om, you know. That's not peace. The Bible says peace is knowing the Savior, knowing God, knowing Christ who came and died for us, knowing that no matter what, God will never stop loving you because he he loved you enough to die for you, knowing that no matter what happens, God will never leave you alone. 
if he's willing to come from heaven, he's willing to, ne- he's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Knowing that no matter what happens in, in the new year or years to come, God will give you the strength to handle it. Knowing that if you live by God's word, you don't have to, you can avoid the needless hang-ups and the hurts and the habits that will mess up your life. That's peace. That's peace. Good news. Salvation, free, freely given, peace, and lastly, because God, God initiates. That's good news. On those, verse, the Bible says, on those whom his favor rests. In the Greek, the idea is, the emphasis is not on the people who the favor rests on, but it says, glory to God in the highest, because he chooses us on those on, on him who, who who has chosen you. God initiates. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Therefore, the good news is this: it's not started by us, and so it won't be ended by us. God has chosen you to be. His, he's asked you to be his child, and he has initiated. He has. He's the one that approached you. You didn't approach him. That's good news. God initiates his love to you. And every time you have good news, what happens? Then the Bible says, good news and great joy. Angels present on the good news, and then we see the shepherds and Mary having great joy. You know, every time, uh, when the Blue Jays won the World Series, some of you may be too young for that, but I remember they won it, you know, they won it twice, <laughs> many years ago. Uh, we did have a Toronto team that won once. And, and when that happened, I remember seeing the news, I was watching, and what happened was, every, uh, spontaneously after the Blue Jays won, there was a parade that went up Young Street, no one organized it. Everyone just flooded on. And I didn't know the Blue Jays. I, I, I confess I wasn't watching at the time. I wasn't following. But then all of a sudden I hear this whole huge crowd of thousands of people going up Young Street. When good news happens, there's great joy. And no one else, you don't have to tell anyone. Just, just see it. A, a, a girl gets engaged. And she doesn't have to tell you she's engaged. You just look at her face. And you see a little aura around her. And you notice how she's always shaking hands with her left hand. Right? <laughs> Whatever, right? Make sure she rubs the ring on your finger or something so you can feel it. It happens. It happens. Good news always comes in great joy. You just, you know. Uh, so what, I was just meditating on this. What's so, why, why the great joy for these shepherds? A couple things. First of all, when, where, and who. When it happened. It happened after, the Bible says, after 400 years of silence. Between the Old Testament and New Testament, there was 400 years of silence. God didn't speak to the pro- through the prophets for 400 years. People didn't have an, uh, a vision for 400 years. And all of a sudden, after 400 years, God shows up. Imagine, I, I, you know, I thought back, what's 400 years from today? 1600s, the time of Shakespeare, colonization of North America, Galileo first sees the moon in his telescope, Taj, the Taj Mahal is built, the, uh, Peter the Great of, is in, in the Great of Russia, Peter the Great is in, in Russia, the Ming Dynasty in China. That's 400 years ago. Imagine if we heard nothing from God for 400 years since then to today, and then something happens this morning. That's good news. What the Jews recognize is that God does not forget His people. God does not forget His people. He hasn't forgotten you. Even if it seems like that. When it happened. Then, who, where it happened. In Bethlehem, verse 15, let's go to Bethlehem, verse 8, living out in the fields nearby, today in the town of David, verse 11. Bethlehem was the town of David, the place where he was born, and the place of the birth of the Messiah. It was prophesied, Micah 5, 2, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So not only does the fact that God, keep, God doesn't forget his people, but he remembered his promise to send the Messiah. God doesn't forget us, and he remembers his promises to us. And then thirdly, it was good news for the shepherds because of who the shepherds are. They weren't kings. They were not royalty. They were not rich. They were not popular. They never had a street named after them. They never wrote a book. They, they, they weren't, they weren't um, skilled in any special way. They were just ordinary people. They're shepherds. In fact, even, you know, shepherds is actually a lowly occupation. You know, shepherds were known to be smelly guys. Okay? They, you know, you, I, I personally, I, I, I used to work on a farm, but, and that was smelly. That was smelly. But um, the, the, I had to wear a, a mask to, to clean the stalls of the calves. It was acidic, let me put it that way. Okay? And sheep, though, are smelly things. It lingers on a person's body. Okay? They were common, average Joes. They were, un- they were unclean physically. They were unclean spiritually. They were often known as thieves. They were, they were considered unreliable. 
and they were not allowed to give testimony in law courts. You couldn't use a shepherd as a witness. Due to the nature of the work, they're often kept from observing the ceremonial laws, so they're often unclean religiously. They were probably devout men, these guys. That's why God you know, came to them. They were devout, but still they are regular guys. And they were underneath, they were slaves, because the whole nation of Israel was underneath Rome. And anyone who was Roman was one notch above anyone who was an Israelite, a Jew. They were slaves. Kind of like us. Maybe you're a slave at work. <laughs> but you're pretty normal. You know, I, okay, I, I don't, don't get mad at me, but I was just thinking this morning. Yeah, you know, I love you all, and I know most of you. I know your background and all that. But, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty average, okay? <laughs> okay, okay? And there's no, uh, you know, no presidents here, right? No, no, no prime ministers here. No movie stars here, right? And in one sense, we're all special. You're all unique, just like the seven, other, seven billion other people in this world. <laughs> in that sense, we're pretty average, right? We're an average church in an average, in an average town in an average country. Of all the countries, Canada's pretty average, right? Uh, even our accent is average. Our accent is bland, right? And we're just like the shepherds. And today is just an average. You know, I, I'm now f- almost 50 years old, and I've, had, I've gone through a lot of Christmases, and this is a pretty average Christmas, okay? <laughs> in the sense of, uh, you know, I didn't get married this year. I didn't have any children this year. Uh, you know, I, I, I thank God for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's pretty average. Pretty average. And yet God came to the shepherds. God came to the shepherds. And, you know, honestly, they're, 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 as I said, they're, they're culturally, they're probably lower than average. They're like, you know, the, those that have, uh, you know, the outsiders in the, the country. They didn't volunteer the church. They weren't especially religious. They didn't give a lot of money to the offering, anything. Right? But they're average. Ordinary people on an ordinary night to an ordinary couple, Mary and Joseph, Joseph the carpenter, at an ordinary barn in an ordinary manger. Yet God loves ordinary people. That's the point. He cares for you. He cares for shepherds. He didn't go to the kings. He didn't go to the movie stars. He didn't go to the, to the dictators in those days. He went to the shepherds. Good news. Salvation is free. Peace, God initiates. Great joy. He does not forget his people. He keeps his promises. He cares for average people. So how should we quickly, quickly how can we respond? Let's look at how the shepherds responded. Let's look at how Mary responded. First of all, the shepherds looked for Jesus. In the midst of all the distractions, we need to look for Jesus. You know, finding Jesus at Christmas is like finding Waldo. Okay? It's just really hard. You know, when you, you, know, you know those books, those Waldo books, right? You, he's got the little guy who looks with the, I think he has a striped shirt, and everywhere, and all the other people. And Christmas is just like that, because you've got so many distractions, right? We've got we have all these things, and we want to look for the perfect gift, and the perfect bargain, the, the, uh, the ideal decoration, and the last parking spot. And right? you're looking for everything in, in, in Christmas time. In the first Christmas, the people, many people missed it. The politicians missed the first Christmas. The business community missed the first Christmas. The innkeeper missed the first Christmas. Even the religious establishment missed the first Christmas. Only the people who were looking for Jesus found him. I was watching uh, Chris Rock on, on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, your, your pastor watches sometimes. And he said this, Famous philosopher Chris Rock <laughs> says this: America has commercialized Christmas, Jesus's birthday. Holes, uh, there's a whole season of materialism. At the end of the season, we even have the nerve to have an economist come on TV to tell us how horrible the Jesus birthday season was this year. Okay, and then Chris Rock mentions Jesus was probably the least materialistic person to ever roam the earth. We gotta declutter our life during Christmas. Just like the shepherds, look for him. Get rid of all the mess and the extra stuff. Yes, you can have the Christmas tree, etc. But do what I, I, I asked the Master Life people in my discipleship class yesterday. I said, during the Christmas season, I want you to block off, hard, hardwire into your schedule, three hours at least, to get rid of all your, your electronic stuff, uh, get off the grid, basically, for three hours, and I want you to just uh, sit quietly with your Bible in front of you, a, pa- a piece of paper and a pen to get rid of all your extraneous thoughts, you know, your to-do list or your get-to-do list, I call them, right? Put them all there, and I want you to focus on Jesus for three hours. If you, if you nap a bit, that's fine, 
Now, the three hours can't be from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., okay? That, the three hours has to be 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. or something like that, okay? But I want you to declutter. Look for Jesus this Christmas season. And then secondly, share the good news. The Bible says, verse 17, they spread the word. Because you're so happy and you love your friends, you'll share the good word. A guy named Greg Smalley wrote this in the, the latest Thrive Family, Thriving Family magazine. We have, by the way, um, uh, uh, sorry, there's the last one in October, but we have the newest one in the foyer now. But the, in the Thriving magazine, he said this, My family and I were getting ready to go on a vacation to Disney World when our four-year-old daughter, Murphy, came out of the door waving her most prized possession. Don't worry, Daddy, Murphy yelled excitedly. I found Gracie. Gracie. How had Murphy found the little praying bunny that I had hidden under, under her pillow? I knew that if we took Gracie with us, Murphy would inevitably lose her, and, I'd, had spent, and I'd, I'd have to spend time trying to find a new Gracie for her. Mommy and Daddy need you to leave Gracie here. We need someone to watch the house while we're away, I explained. I continued to provide reasons to leave the stuffed animal behind. Finally, I became very stern and said, Go put her back in your bed. Murphy her head down and tears flowing, asked, Are we going to have fun at Disney World? Absolutely, I said. Then I explained that, that the brochure said it's the happiest place on earth. Murphy slowly handed Gracie to me. Daddy, she said, if we're going to have that much fun, I love Gracie so much, I want you to take her, and I'll stay at home and watch the house for you. <laughs> Needless to say, both Murphy and Gracie had a great time at Disney World. If you truly love your friends, you'll share good news with them, whatever way you have to, this Christmas season. If you truly love them, look to Jesus, share the good news, worship. Verse 20, they returned, the shepherds glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I was listening to the CHFI 98.1, uh, and Aaron was talking about, um, the, the host was saying, last, she, was, um, she just listened, to this, uh, they had a song you know, at the Christmas station, they had, uh, and then the St. Michael's Choir uh, was singing. And she was saying, you know, last time, uh, you know, she started crying, you know, that's Aaron. <laughs> and, and then she said, um, last year, St. Michael's Choir had paid their own way to go sing for the Pope in Italy. Right? And, and for his holiness, she called him, right? And I thought, you know, here's these young men and young boys and, and the choir master prepared probably months and months, and they paid their own way just to go to Italy, just to sing for a guy. That's a lot of work. Just so they can say, we sang for the Pope okay? once in my life. And we get to sing for the King of Kings every Sunday. We get to worship him every Sunday. And we don't have to pay to go to Italy. What a privilege it is to sing and to praise God. I, I love the worship team every Sunday. I love this one, especially this, this, this morning. That's what the shepherds did. All of a sudden, it hit them in their midst, in their little town of Bethlehem. There was this king, this king of kings. And they said, we got, in the, in the Greek, the original language, there's a sense of urgency. You can't express it in English. He said, we got to go see this guy. We got to worship him. We got to worship him. And even Mary, in finally ended with this, she, what she did in verse 19 says, she treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She treasured God. She recognized the treasure that came out of her womb. And she was thinking about it. She pondered it in her heart and a sense of worship. Um, Genesis 15.1, God says to Abraham, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. You've all got something that you really cherish in your life. You know, something that you're obsessed with. Your car, your sneakers, your doll, your trophy, your wedding ring. You polish it up. You keep it, you keep an eye on it. You think about it all the time. You know, you're the, it's, it's, it's your shrimp for you, the bubba, right? You have your bubba shrimp. And you're always thinking and talking about this one thing. Mary, at Christmas time, the Bible says she treasured this precious thought and she pondered it and she let it be her all in all. She, she was all in. Or what some might say yeah, she doubled down. <laughs> it's everything on this one child. The pearl of great price. They sacrificed everything else to attain that one pearl of great price. There's a guy named, is the, the writer's O. Henry, 
Okay, O is his first initial. Henry is his last name. O. Henry write, wrote a sweet tale <laughs> called, called The Gift of the Magi. You might have heard of it. It talks about Jim and Della, a young married couple who are struggling financially. At Christmas time, as Christmas approaches, they want to give special gifts to each other, but their lack of money drives them to, to drastic measures. Jim's prized possession was his, his gold watch, while Della's prized possession was her long, beautiful hair. Ironically, Jim sells his watch in order to buy some combs for Della's long hair. And Della sells her hair to buy a chain for Jim's gold watch. This is a famous story. It's beloved because people realize what Christmas is really about. Christmas is not about getting something. She ends up with a comb for, and she got short hair. He ends up with a chain with no, no watch. But the point was, they both realized the real present they had was each other at Christmas time. It wasn't the chain or the, 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 the watch or the hair. Christmas is about a person, Jesus Christ. And then he tells us to remember Christmas not about him, but also about loving the people around you. People before products, before possessions, before prizes, before profits, before prestige, before pride, before position, before power, before privilege, before popularity, promotion, and pleasure. People. One person, Jesus Christ, and also treasure the people around you. Ask any of those families this, this, that just came up, what's your most prized achievement or gift this year? It was their baby. Ask any person getting baptized later on, what's the greatest thing about being a Christian? Is it you know, the gifts you get at baptism? Is it church membership? You know, you're getting out of hell or something, right? No, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a person. Ask any parent. You know, I, people, I tell people, you know, you offer me a billion dollars for my wife and my two, my two sons, I would not take it. I'm a rich man already. I've got them. What's the greatest thing about being a pastor? Not the title, reverend, doctor, or whatever position, preaching. It's the people. It's you guys. You make me happy. And the fact that I get to, 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 to be a servant of my best friend, Jesus Christ. Let Jesus Christ be your present this year. You may not have time to be with family. You may not get a lot of presents. You may not have vacation time. The best, the best present in the universe is Jesus Christ. That's the point of Christmas. All those stories. Shepherds, angels, wise men from the East. What, that's the point of all the miracles in the New Testament. Of Jesus walking on the water, healing the sick, blind, the lame, the deaf, the speechless, raising the dead, feeding 5,000. To show that Jesus is the most precious gift. That's the whole point of the Bible. The focus on Jesus Christ. He is the present. I think I have time to share this last story. My, this week I met my old high school friend, Bill Howe. He used to be, a, he, he walked with the Lord for a while and then he gave up and, and he started getting into drugs. He's a trucker, he trucked all over North America and got into drugs and alcohol. Uh, about 10 years ago, he was top of the stairs on, on Christmas day, uh, around Christmas season, went to pick up something on top of the stairs, fell over, fell all the way down the stairs, broke his neck two places, see something and see something else. I forgot what level, but he ended up being, Bill ended up being paralyzed from the neck down. And then after that, because he got paralyzed, he, he, he grew, he ballooned to 300 pounds. Complete, his life was almost, the doctor said, you'll never walk again. You know what happened after? He broke his neck. He came back to the Lord. And today, when I met him at Yorkdale Mall for, for lunch, uh, he, he has a guide dog and all that. Very expensive guide dog, by the way. <laughs> Very expensive. But he walked, he, he came in on his cane. And he said, you know, and he comes, and he, he's a slim guy now. He lost all that weight. He says, you know, God saved my life by breaking my neck. Because he told me what's really important in life. It's Jesus Christ. Now he's an inspirational speaker, and he speaks all over, you know, and, and, he, and he's, he, he worships downtown. I, I want to bring him up one day to share with you. Jesus is the present. No matter what happens, you're going through a divorce, You've got huge health issues. You're, you just lost your job. You're failing at school. Your, your family's falling apart. There's still a present in there in Christmas this year. Who's worth more than all that? All that stuff is very painful. It's very real. But he's more real. 
He's the present that you keep on wrapping for the rest of your life. It's Jesus Christ. Don't give him up this year. Don't go for the other stuff. He's the only one that's worth it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing more valuable than him. He is to be our all in all. We'd rather have Jesus than anything else this world can afford today. The silver, the gold, the positions, the power, the pleasures, the vacations, the cruises. He is our Christmas present. And we thank you that nothing, no one, this whole universe can take us away from the free gift of Jesus Christ who gives us good news and great joy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's uh...